there a warning? Was there a health warning before I came on? <laughs> no, but I should have. I really should have. <laughs> One day I'll learn. All right. Um, we have, it looks like 80 people online, which is wonderful. Nice. So uh, allow me to say um, a big, warm, heartfelt welcome to everyone. Um, to this webinar hosted by um, the Danish 3P Association, uh, 3PDK. We are a nonprofit association um, with the purpose of spreading the very hopeful message of the three principles. Um, and uh, we are um, doing lots of different activities such as webinars, um, but you can see more uh, about what we do on 3pdk.org um, and you should come join us. So if you're not a member of, of the association, come join us. We, we do lots of uh, great things and we're able to invite wonderful speakers to join us. Uh, and I'm very, very happy. When's one coming? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> very happy tonight to, uh, to introduce uh, Michael Neal. Um, Michael is a, uh, a coach, a speaker, a very prolific author. Uh, he has written a number of books on the principles, um, including my personal favorite, which is The Inside Out Revolution. And that one also exists in Danish. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read this book, I highly recommend it. I keep uh, coming back to it. Um, and it is uh, just really profound and uh, transformational. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Michael for a number of years, um, and uh, I know that we're all in for a treat tonight. Um, the title of, of uh, tonight's talk is A Spiritual Life, um, and I can't think of anyone better to, uh, to walk us through that uh, very lovely topic. So, Michael, over to you. Thank you very much. I, I will hasten to say that the title was not chosen by me. Um, however, when the title was presented to me, I thought, cool, that sounds like a fun thing to talk about. So what? Here, here's my plan. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the phrase a spiritual life means to me and, and how that relates to my understanding of these principles. I'm then going to read, uh, and I kind of chose it a little bit at random, but I'm going to read from a transcript of a Sid Banks talk, one of his early talks. So those of you who've gone back to read any of the, the Sid materials, most of what is available is what I would call the, the psychological era of Sid. It was Sid's teaching after he spent a lot of time working with psychologists. So a lot of the principles are, the way he talks about them is related to psychology. But the first thing that Sid and the last thing that would Sid would say to any of the psychologists before they'd go off to teach or work with their clients was, don't forget, it's spiritual. And, and in some of his early, um, audios which aren't publicly available but you can sometimes find them floating around youtube or people have illegally uploaded them and all kind of cool stuff i obviously can't sanction that but they're out there you should look um uh, this this is from one that i'll read a bit from called a spiritual reality now i'm going to share i'm going to share a bit of what sid had to say and then we're going to we're going to open it up to explore together um uh, I've been warned that Danish people are shy, and I'm like, yeah, you know, take me to a country other than America where people don't say that. But, but the the truth is, this is only relevant to you. Like I can tell you about my experience and my life, and that's cool and good for me. But. It's your experience of spirit, whatever that winds up meaning to you, or whatever, whatever is that feeling of connection to all life, whatever word you have for that. That's what's going to make the difference in your life. Not pretty things that I say, not pretty things that Sid Banks said, but the actual real-time experience that you have. Now, for me, the phrase a spiritual life 
I want to distinguish it from a couple of similar but different phrases. I, I know from experience that sometimes if I were to say a spiritual life, what people hear is a religious life, a life in tune with the teachings of whatever religion the person grew up in or practices. And there usually are a lot of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs in that. Another way that somebody might talk about that, even if they weren't particularly religious is, oh, you mean like a moral life, which means a life lived as best you can in accordance with a set of good, bad, right, wrongs about human beings and human behavior. Um, the Ten Commandments being a somewhat famous one in most Western cultures. Right. Oh, so you a spiritual life, so living in accordance with the Ten Commandments. Oh, a spiritual life, so living the way Jesus taught. Oh, a spiritual life, so living in harmony with the teachings of Allah. A spiritual life, so... And no, that's not what I'm talking about. When I use the phrase a spiritual life, I am talking about a life infused with spirit. I am talking about a life lived in harmony with whatever it is that makes nature alive, the animating spirit. A spiritual life is a very alive thing. It is a completely real-time phenomenon. It is simply valuing our awareness of spirit, of aliveness, of energy, of whatever it is in life that is before any of the manifestations. Whatever it is in living grass, in a living human. I've heard it sometimes talked about as the the, everyone can tell the difference between the quick and the dead, between that which is alive and that which is not alive. So a spiritual life is a living truth. It is a alive to aliveness, awake to awakeness, conscious of consciousness, aware of awareness. And it is kind of just a way of being in the world. And it does not preclude or require anything of us. There is, there is no job description which will make you have more or less of a spiritual life. In fact, one of my favorite uh, teaching stories in, uh, from, from the Eastern traditions is of a, a monk who lived a spiritual life. And that, that just meant that his life was infused with spirit. And he didn't seem that different to any of the other monks in the way that he lived, because he did what monks did back then. But for those who could feel, those who had eyes to see and ears to hear, there was something that you felt in his presence. And one day he, he came home and his house was being robbed. And he walked right in on the thief with the big comic book sack. I don't know, like, you know, the, the image you have in your mind of a thief, but, you, you know, the big sack of goods. And, and, you know, having been discovered, the thief, you know, went running, you know, away and, and, uh, you know, the monk briefly looked around his apartment and there was, there was nothing there but one shoe <laughs> was pretty much all that was left of his possessions. And so he grabs the shoe and he starts chasing after the guy. And the guy's running, but of course, you know, he's a pretty fit monk and the guy's carrying all of the monk's possessions. So at some point, the guy, the guy goes, okay, puts, puts the bag down and, you know, he's like, what are you going to do with that shoe? And, and the monk just hands him the shoe and said, you know, the one you've got won't be any good without this one. And the thief was so taken aback by the, the generosity and the utter lack of judgment or 
anything that he experienced from the monk that he 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 knelt down and he asked for forgiveness and he asked if he could become a student of the monk and the monk accepted him as a student and over time the the thief monk became enlightened woke up to his true nature his spiritual nature began to live full time in spirit and you know as was the way back then when the student became enlightened tradition was that they would go off to teach and so everyone asked him you know what are you going to do are you going to go off to teach and he said no i i think i'm 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 going to go back to being a thief i was really good at it nice to kind of get my hands dirty again no one but you know how can you be a thief? You're, you're spiritual. You're enlightened. And I went, well, what does that have to do with it? Everybody's got to do something. And I think the reason that I so love that story is because it really points to the fact that our ideas of spirituality are make-believe. They're pretty pictures. They're people who behave in a certain way. Spirit is just pure love, pure aliveness, pure consciousness. It's got nothing to do with what you do or don't do. And for me, as I saw that more and more, it, it, it got so much easier because I stopped having to try to be a good person so that I could be spiritual. So that people would know I was, well, look how spiritual he is. He doesn't eat meat. He doesn't even eat vegetables that were abused. He only eats kindly treated vegetables. It's like, I, I, that was hard. But to actually live life each day alive to aliveness, infused with spirit that's not only not so hard it, it's really gorgeous so here's here's sid talking about a spiritual reality he said it really exists it's not a theory it truly truly exists a spiritual reality which is inside you now back where you came from. You simply go back to where you came from. And the journey back must be spiritual, which is love. That is the only way. To memorize words is like poetry, but the breath of life isn't in the word. The breath of life comes beyond the word. When you feel, when you go beyond the boundaries of your own little mind, you go beyond that. It shows you the secret to the mind. Therefore, it brings you peace. Because you know how to use your mind. You know how to find tranquility. You know how to find sanity. The mind is the strongest thing in the entire universe. There is nothing that can possibly be beyond the mind. Because the mind is God. Eastern philosophies talk about little mind, big mind. And the little mind exists in the imagination of mankind. This is your free will. Free will and free mind. But someday, if you ever wake up, you find out it's just a hoax. Because you never did have a free will and a free mind. Because God being the allness has to be the mind and the will. So there is only one will, and that is the will of God. That when you stop fighting, then the greatest servant of all will serve you. Anything you want, because the greatest servant of all is God. It gives everything that you ever wanted. Everything. If you can see the fact that you've already got it, but the manifestation of the fact only comes when true faith appears. And you see beyond the limitations of the little mind. 
then the fact appears. And when it appears, it appears as a miracle because it's quite non-understandable because a miracle does not take place from the little mind or from here, what we call nature. All miracles take place from the big mind, that which we call God. But somewhere in the depths of your own mind, you know everything that's ever been said about God. You understand the little mind, the big mind. You understand how to bring happiness. You understand how to bring health. You understand how to bring youth. It's there. It's yours. It's been granted to you. It's been given to you on a platter. All you have to do is to change your mind. Drop beliefs and concepts for spiritual facts. And when you see a spiritual fact at that second, you're touching your own true consciousness. This divine consciousness, which is the link between the inner world and the outer world. The same missing consciousness is the link between sickness and health. That same link is the secret of a happy marriage, a happy life, the secret to all things. And it's yours. This is why Christ said to look within because it's yours. Never mind what anybody else ever said. Never mind what I say. I swear, never mind what I say. Find the feeling within yourself. And it's in beautiful, positive feelings because it's in love that this door opens. And all of a sudden, a spiritual reality that you've been looking for all your life, the one that's so full of information and knowledge, it's yours. The state of meditation is where you'll find it. But the state of meditation is not a form. It's simply a mind that is at peace with itself, that is in a state of happiness and a state of understanding. Here is where the secret to all your happiness will come. And when it comes, it's real. It's not a belief. It's yours. It's yours for eternity. It's the mind. It creates our problems, then it solves them, our little mind. Now, for me, I, I probably would say I, I hear something a little different every time that I read that. But the thing that really kind of was jumping out as I was reading it just now is that it's just waiting for us beyond belief, just beyond concept, just beyond our ideas of what it should be. And well, wait, what's consciousness again? And, and, and how is thought different from? And it's underneath all of that, just waiting for us to drop out of this and drop into what's already holding us up. It's almost like if you've ever been out for a walk and you get really caught up in your head and, and then for whatever reason, you just suddenly notice, oh my God, <laughs> I, I'm in beautiful surrounding. It, it's like that. But instead of it being just the form of nature, it's our spiritual nature before the form. And it is the beauty that we see reflected in the world around us, in the people around us, in the, the animals around us. I'm, I'm, I, I guess I can probably show you. I'm surrounded by dogs right now. I'm being, I'm being licked to death um, in the background. But that beauty, that aliveness, that stillness, that presence is always present. We're just shockingly good at not noticing. And if, if what learning about the principles does for you is it makes it a little harder for you to not notice the miracle you're already a part of, that's pretty cool. The other thing for me that really 
jumped out this time. Is that there's no conditions. There's no prerequisites. You don't have to be in a beautiful setting. You don't have to have your life sorted out. We don't have to cure COVID first. Nothing needs to happen first because it is already present and available. We are already being animated by it. We're just very distractible creatures. I remember once saying to a group of coaches that I was working with that every client I've ever met, what they have in common is they're preoccupied with something, right? Their mental space, their consciousness is already occupied with their problems, whether it's their business problems or their personal problems or the problems of the world. And because it's preoccupied, there's not a lot of room for spirit in there. Now, what's interesting is if you start with spirit, there's still plenty of room for the world. So I don't know if you've ever um, uh, heard the story or even tried it. It's actually more fun if you try it. Of It's usually taught in the context of time management. And somebody comes in and they bring a big jug and they bring a bunch of um, uh, big rocks and they bring some small rocks and they bring some sand and they bring water. And the challenge to the students is get all of this into that. And so common, common move is people pour in the water and then try and add everything, but the water starts to overflow or they pour in the sand, but then there isn't room for the big rocks. And it turns out the only way you can do it is you put in the big rocks first, then the smaller rocks, then the sand, and then the water, and there's room for all of it. Well, when it comes to life, the big rocks are spirit. The big rock is this aliveness. It is this intelligence. It is this larger nature that we are a part of. It's the ocean that we are a drop of water in. And then there's room for your life. There's room for the world of form. There's room for all of it if we start with spirit. When we start with the world, it often doesn't feel like there's room for spirit. You're the only one who can know if you're living a spiritual life. I can look at your life and go, oh, well, clearly this person isn't living a spiritual life because they're doing this and they're not doing that. But that's not telling me anything. That's telling me about what you do. I can't look at somebody and go, well, clearly they're not spiritual because they're doing this and they're doing that. But that's not telling me if they are alive with spirit if they are filled to overflowing with God, it's just telling me what they happen to be doing with their time, with their life. But you can know if you're living a spiritual life because you will feel more or less alive to spirit, infused with spirit. And I like the word infused because to me, it's, the, a lot of spiritual practices are like, drink this, right? And, and, and then you too will be spiritual. And, and to me, infused, it, it sort of suggests it's like osmosis, like you infuse a tea bag in hot water. Like we're soaking in it. And so it's being infused. It's filling us up even if we're not doing anything. I, I spent a little time playing around with hyperbaric tents um, at a certain point. So basically a hyperbaric chamber is this 
hyper oxygenized space. And the idea is it's meant to have all sorts of healing properties for the body. Um, that you, you know, it makes you stronger. It makes you um, just everything works better. It heals. I mean, it's the the, the host of claims is quite impressive. Um, all I ever noticed was, yeah, I feel really good when I come out. But what was interesting about it is it doesn't matter what you do when you're in it. So you can go into a hyperbaric tent and read books about spirituality. You can go into a hyperbaric tent and read books about oxygen. You can go into a hyperbaric tent and draw pictures. You can go into a hyperbaric tent and watch Netflix. It works exactly the same. So if you have spiritual practices and you like them, well, why would you stop doing them? But if you're doing them because you think that's how you're gonna get spiritual, you, you're missing something a little bit more fundamental. You're soaking in it right now. We're already in the tent. It doesn't matter what we do while we're in here. And you will know because you'll feel it. You'll feel alive. You'll feel attuned. You'll feel presence. You'll be present to presence, alive to aliveness, conscious of consciousness, aware of awareness. Now, if somebody is somewhat present and attuned, they'll probably notice that in you. And if they're preoccupied, like 99% of the people, 99% of the time, they may never know. Personally, I, I, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to win that award. A friend of mine actually did. He, he, we, we, we give him a lot of crap because he was actually won an award called Spiritual Personality of the Year. And it was just that that just is a really funny award that they give out. Um, but the reward of spirit is personal. It is for you. Now, I think, and from everything I've read, that there's a benefit for humanity, that there is a tipping point, that when enough of us are infused with spirit, and I've heard numbers ranging from 7% to 13% to 51%, it's like a tipping point and suddenly everybody wakes up to it. I don't know. In the meantime, I'm okay with living a spiritual life because it's the most beautiful way I've found to live. And it's with me when I'm with my dogs and it's with me when I'm with my kids and it's with me when I'm with my wife and it's with me when I'm working on my business. And it's with me when I'm watching football it doesn't go anywhere, but from time to time I do. I get caught up in my worries and my problems and my thinking, and I lose touch with it. I'm still soaking in it, but I don't notice. It's still sustaining me, but it doesn't feel like it is. And so I go out into the world and start looking for something else to sustain me because I don't believe that spirit can be sustaining me because I'm not feeling it. And so I look for imitation love, imitation aliveness, imitation spirit. It's not the same, but maybe it's better than nothing if that was the other choice. Fortunately, that's never the other choice. Literally, in this moment, you are spirit. You are full. You are animated. The only variable is how much you notice. And noticing really is key. Because when we notice it, it somehow amplifies it. Now, I don't know if it really amplifies it. Or if it just, that when I notice it, I feel it. 
But that's why there's so much emphasis in Sid's teaching on the feeling. Because it's in the feeling that we notice. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever um, gotten stoned, and I don't know if you're allowed to admit it if you ever have. But one of the things that I noticed when I was in my kind of late teens, early 20s, which was, you know, before I realized that getting stoned just gave me headaches, but it was really easy to be present when I was stoned because it was quite interesting, the feeling. I didn't feel the same need to distract myself with the world. Well, in a lot of ways, I've found living a spiritual life, a life infused with spirit, like being functionally stoned most of the time. I'm very much in the feeling of being alive. And I'm able to do whatever there is to do in my world. So again, you wouldn't be able to tell on any given day, is Michael spiritual today? But if you're hanging out and you're in a pretty quiet place, you'll know if you are, if you're in touch with that in you, and you'll have a pretty good sense of the people around you. Are they in touch with it? Now, even when they're not in touch with it, they are no less God. They are no less spirit. But they're really not benefiting from it. And that's why in so many different ways, 3P teachers try and kind of point people towards that deeper nature that is always present underneath the noise of our thinking. Jack Pransky once asked Sid, what is that feeling? Because everybody kind of knows that feeling. You get a little quiet, you get a little peaceful. You have a sense of being just a little bit more tuned in and connected up. You know, Natasha and Dickon will tell you you're coming home. And Sid said that feeling is pure consciousness uncontaminated by our personal thinking. Now, uncontaminated does not mean there is no personal thinking. It just means it's not getting in the way. And that's why there's, there's nothing to do, but there's something to see. the more we see that we are already resting in this, the more we get a feel for what it is to live from this space in us, this consciousness in us, this aliveness in us, this spirit in us. The more, the more. The more we see it, the more we feel it. The more we feel it, the easier it is to see. And then we live our lives. And if what occurs to us to do and makes sense to us to do is become a, a monk or a nun or a sage or a teacher, we do that. And if what makes sense as to us is to become a, a thief or a movie star or a plumber or a homemaker, then that's what we do. Always loved in the uh, Christian tradition, a line from Philip Yancey in a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. And he said, when we talk about agape love, unconditional love, God's love, what we are saying is that there is nothing you can do that will make God love you any more. And there is nothing you can do that will make God love you any less. And I would say the same is true about spirit. 
there is nothing you can do that will make you more spiritual. And there's nothing you can do that will make you less spiritual. But if you're not alive to the spirit that runs through you, that animates you, for all intents and purposes, it would be a bit weird to call it a spiritual life. And if you are, it would be a bit weird not to call it that. Even if it doesn't look anything like what people think of as what spiritual people do. So that's an awful lot of me and an awful lot of sin. I'd love to hear from you. What do you see? What do you, what's occurring to you? Is there anything in there that's landed? Are there any questions that that brings up? I don't know if you have a way of doing this, Lena, that you like. But. Yeah, just anyone who's got a question, just pop your hand up so that I can see, and then we'll go from there. There's got to be a question out there. be one of those Scandinavian things. Could be. I, 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 was, I, was, I was told that um, the story of, uh, uh, I, actually, I think it was probably a Norwegian, not a Dane. A lot of you can nod knowingly now, but uh, you know, that, uh, you know, Olaf loved his wife so much that one day after 40 years of marriage, he almost told her, <laughs> well there you go and when speaking to scandinavian crowds you always have to be careful not comparing right so that wasn't I, <laughs> but we do have a question I, now um so esther please ask your question hello 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 thank you for this speech and uh, thank you for your coughing for the soul. I really love listening to it. Um, I would like to hear if you have any thoughts about speaking to people, um, telling them about the three principles in this life, when they are really skeptical and only see religion in what you're saying. Like, mm. if it's just... Because I think the Scandinavian countries, they, there's a lot of uh, uh, the intellect, the intellect is, is really <laughs> heavy <laughs> and you have to have like a hardcore evidence for everything that you um, present in a lot of settings. So just some thoughts. I'm sure you have met a lot of uh, situations where you have to talk about this. <laughs> well, I, I, I have. And what I've found is... And this is just what I found. Nine times out of 10, the person who's talking about it is more uptight about it than the person who's listening. It, 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 it's, if you don't care, they tend to not really overreact. And I have talked to scientists and data scientists and engineers. I have talked to people who are deeply religious and, and I sort of have come to marvel over the years that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Sometimes they have to translate the words. What, one of the reasons that the, a lot of these older audios are not readily available is because Sid was aware that in the, old, in the olden days, he would talk a lot about Christ consciousness and God, and, and there were people who wouldn't, they just stopped listening at that point. And so he sort of, neutralized his language in his later teaching. I, I'm still at a point where if you can't get past the word, then we don't have sufficient relationship for us to be talking about it anyways. You know, I think sometimes we can get a little preachy. And so we, we go in to talk about it when we don't have permission. There's no relationship, there's no connection. 
I presume in a group like this, where it's a 3P group, and I know a lot of people have listened to me and heard about me, I've got a certain degree of permission. Um, I'm not expecting uh, Lena and Natasha or anyone to get an angry email going, he said God four times, right? Um, if, if they do, I'll laugh with them, <laughs> you know? but, but no, if I was going into an ordinary group, I would just trust that what will come out of me, the way it will come out of me will be appropriate to that group. I notice with interest when I speak in a church, I don't swear that much. When I speak in an assembly hall, I swear like a fucking sailor. It's not on purpose. I just kind of trust that the bit of me that's tuned into the room will find language that's appropriate to the room. But I would never go in saying, oh, I can't talk about God. This is a business seminar. In fact, I did. I don't know if anyone here would have been there, but in about 2014, I did a number of trainings in, in, in Copenhagen and Aarhus and around that part of the country. And I did a business day. Um, so the audience was made up of teams from uh, some of the top companies in Denmark, uh, from uh, one of the political groups, one of the... Uh, and, and so it was quite a, a high level. It was a bank uh, people. And I didn't on purpose not say God, but I noticed with interest that I didn't. Like I was like, hmm, I'm, I'm not talking about this in a particularly spiritual sounding way using any particular spiritual language, because often I do. So I noticed that I didn't. Well, the end of that day, we uh, had each team make a presentation on what they'd gotten and how it related to what their work their And I'm not kidding. Every single group mentioned God and or spirit in their presentation, even though I never did. And that was interesting to me too. So it's like anything, you can make anything into a thing. It doesn't have to be a thing. Thank you, Asta. Thank you, Asta. Great question. Let's see if we have any other questions. And if anyone is sitting with a question in Danish that they'd like to ask, I'm more than happy to translate. So don't let that stop you. Let's see if, if anyone's just summoning their courage. Um, this is a little post-it that I have on my wall and it says, there is no place that God is not. And that was actually from one of our trainings, Michael, because you were, you were talking to us and you, you grabbed your, your mug, your, your coffee mug, and you said, you know, this is God too. And, you know, I thought you were referring to the coffee because I know you like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but, I can worship this stuff, man. <laughs> but the illustration of, um, you know, there are no exceptions, as we, we say that very often within the principles, right? There are no exceptions, but the very deep, profound truth of that is that there is no place that God is not. And that can, that can be a lot to take in, but wow, <laughs> when you do. Yeah, I think the very first advanced course I ever taught, the, the, the three weekly themes, it, it was... I, I remember two of them, which is um, what's not thought and where is God not? <laughs> <laughs> no I can show you guys my garden. I don't know. Kind of the roses are just kind of out in bloom now. So I don't can actually see any of that. But, uh, it's, uh, very nice here. And I was particularly enjoying that the birds were, were singing for us as you were talking before. We have a question from Anna. Please. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi, Michael. Hi. I, I Hi. joined quite late, so I, you might have talked about it and then I haven't heard it. But I've been uh, listening to some of your um, talks about making decisions. 
Uh, and then I have uh, one of my good friends. Uh, he is uh, about my age, 40. And she has a lot of thoughts about whether to um, have a child or not. And for her, it seems like this huge decision. And I've talk, talked a little to her about the three principles, but mostly I've like tried to figure out how, how do I think about this? And I know that you say there are no big decisions and I know in a way it doesn't matter because she can be happy whether she, she gets a child or not. But how would you approach, uh, how would you I mean, talk to somebody when they have these, for them, big decisions? And I get caught up because I think I, I can understand. She has a lot, of, lot yeah. of thoughts about why not. And I'm not one that's able, so she has uh, avoided it. And she has a lot of mm. yeah thoughts going on, on, of course. But yeah, I could be curious to hear your uh, Thoughts about that? Yeah, I, so there, there's not necessarily an answer that I think I would say this. I think what I would do, and I have talked to people in exactly that situation, um, is, is I would probably start with a question along the lines of, why do you care? Not with an implication that they shouldn't, but for some reason, this feels like a big decision to them. Yeah. And in listening, I would trust that either they would hear something mm. in being listened to, or I would hear something yeah. that wouldn't sit with reality. Like I often, when I listen, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm not really listening for anything, but what I notice is well, that was weird. What I notice is, oh, there's a loose thread on their jumper. Mm. You know, that's that's kind of weird. And what I know to do is pull on it. Now, sometimes it's just literally a loose thread and it comes out and yeah. nothing happens. Sometimes the jumper starts coming with it and okay. then something starts to unravel. Yeah. So I would listen till something occurred to me. But I would know that even if nothing occurred to me, just being listened to, yeah, there'd be a reasonable chance that something would occur to them that was new. Now, often it is to do in those kinds of situations with somebody thinking that their happiness and well-being is dependent on an external circumstance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that would be the thing where I go, well, that's not true. Yeah. So we would explore it if yeah. they wanted to explore it. And, and she has this, she like, she, she's 40, so the, it's, it's getting time if she wants to have uh, kids. And, and also her husband is like- So I'll, start, I'll, so I'll, I'll pause you right there. Yeah, because- See, that's, that's her story. Yeah. Right, that's why it's important. I'm 40. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and her, and her well, husband. no, it's important because my husband. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter what. In in her mind, there are conditions that make happiness more or less of a possibility. Yeah, can I ask again? Because I get caught up in this. So she she thinks she needs to make a decision now, because <laughs> I know otherwise her husband uh, he wants kids. And, and she doesn't want, yeah. want to, um, to lose him. Um, she's quite sure about him. So one of the things I know, and again, I don't want to pretend this is what I would say to her because I, I don't even know what I'm going to say to you, right? You're actually here with me, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but what, what comes to mind is, do you know whether or not you want children? And if, if she says no and seems to really go no, I go, then, then maybe that's not the way you're going to make the decision, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to just make your husband happy? If you don't really have a sense of it, you know, if you want to just do what you think your husband thinks will make him happy, because mm -hmm. that that's not necessarily a stupid idea, right? Now, what I would actually expect, though, is she absolutely knows. 
And she has a lot of fear about yeah. something that she's making up as a consequence of the decision. Yeah. yeah. And so I would expect by saying that, well, just do what your husband wants. You should go, whoa, what? And that, that knowing might come to the surface. Yeah. But, but I don't know. No, I, and I, and, and, but it's just, just the five, three minutes, just the threat. And also just because I get caught up. So already just saying, ah, ah, ah. Yeah makes me see ah uh, i get caught up in thought as well as as she does so that's really yeah, helpful. no we're, we're beautiful because yeah it's true when we start buying into our clients thought created reality we lose a lot of our ability to help them yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah nice thank you thank you very much pleasure thanks Anna. we do actually now have a question in the chat so i'm just going to read it out to you michael all right um, the question is, uh, my question is how, in capital letters, is like Morpheus said to Neo, there is a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. I can only show you the door, you are the one who have to walk through it. But how do you let go and start to walk the path? How do you unplug or wake up? Well, it's actually remarkably simple. Notice when you're holding on. Like that's where our feelings are so helpful, right? They'll let you know. If you're really caught up and angsty and worried and stressed and scared, and that's letting you know, hey, you're holding on. When you're not, that's kind of feedback from the system letting you know, hey, you're in the flow of life. You're back to the present moment. I think what throws us is we think we've got to do it once and for all. We want to wake up and never go back to sleep. That doesn't seem to have been on offer for 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do. And I think anybody who's walks this kind of path recognizes it. There's it, 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 there's a few different versions of it and you can kind of see it, which of these, if any of these resonate. There's the, well, I can't be friends anymore with people who don't see this because you know they're just shallow and they're talking about these things and I wanna be over here. And if that's clean for you, so no problem, we get to choose who we spend time with. But for most people, it isn't clean. It's kind of righteous. So sometimes what people are actually reacting to isn't our spirituality, it's our righteousness. And that's quite off-putting. <laughs> like, it doesn't even matter what you're righteous about. You know, it can be politics, it can be spirituality, it can be football teams. It's like, there's a certain point where just that energy is uncomfortable for most people to be around and it doesn't be around. So that's one thing that sometimes happens. You know, the, um, the inadvertent proselytizing. Um, a second thing is sometimes people sense that that energy and they don't know what it is and they're uncomfortable with it. I was giving a talk in London. There's a, a, a church in Piccadilly Circus, Saint, Saint, uh, I think it's St. James, but it's one of the oldest cathedrals in London. It's uh, where William Blake, the poet, was baptized. And once a year for the last, in fact, last year was the first year in 13 years, I didn't give a talk there. I give a talk there and there's usually about 400 people, some who know about me, some who don't, but people who just, they make it very accessible for people to come to the, those talks. And one woman came up to me uh, afterwards and said, I just want to say, you know, and she said very nice things about me and her experience. She said, but the best thing was I finally got my husband to come and listen to you. And, and she said it was wonderful. And I said, oh, did he enjoy it? She said, no, he hated it. He left. And I was like, oh, 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 okay, what, why is that good? And she said, well, because he said, there's a really weird feeling here. I, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm out. And, and she was so excited that he felt it. Now, he thought it was evil and darkness, but, but the fact that he could feel it, let her know, good. Like, this will now do its thing. He is now awake to this, even if right now he's made up a scary story about it. So sometimes people do just get uncomfortable because they can feel it and they don't know what it is and it doesn't fit. I had a client once who, came to me with agoraphobia. So she literally, her boyfriend brought her, she was lying down on the backseat of his car under a pile of coats. Like she was that scared to be out. And I asked her about her story and she said, oh, I remember the day this began. She said, I was on a bus in South London and there was a little girl on the bus and I looked at the little girl and it was like her skin dissolved and her bones dissolved and she was just pure energy. and I looked at myself and the same thing was happening to me. And suddenly it was like, there was no barrier between that little girl and me. And she said, and then I looked at this old woman on the bus and the same thing happened. We dissolved into this energy. So there was no difference between us. And everywhere I looked, everything was just dissolving into pure energy. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, you have this beautiful mini Kensho experience, this awakening experience. And she said, and, and, and I looked around and everything was dissolving. And that's the moment I knew that Satan had come into my brain. Now, my, my brilliant life-changing coaching was I gave her a copy of a book called What is Enlightenment that described about 30 experiences like the one she had. And uh, I lost touch with her. And then a few years later, her entire life had changed as a result of just seeing that for what it was and no longer buying into the scary story she had about what it might be. And the last thing, and this is the last thing is, yeah, sometimes we just outgrow people. And I wouldn't be quick to assume that because that tends to be more on the righteous side. Well, I get this now and they don't get it. So I've outgrown them. It's not an intellectual thing. It's just like, look, there are friends I had in school that I still love hanging out with. And there are friends I had in school that it's nice to see them for a minute. 
any of that kind of land? Thank you. Yes, it's it's nice. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Michael, are you okay for us to take one more question? Yeah, absolutely. If it's there, let's do it. Let's do it. So uh, Enya and a gentleman on Enya's computer, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm Hakan. I'm Enya's uh, partner. And she Hello. also let me uh, listen in. Uh, and thank you for that. Enya, first of course, but Michael, you as well. Really, really uh, pleasant to listen to you. Um, I just, I just had a question or comment, or you know, you you be the judge of that at the end. But uh, um, you know, I've, I've been like dabbling into like spiritualism for uh, more than twenty years, and um, listening a bit into the three P on the side. It's there's a lot of um, commonalities, uh, and you know, I'm very into teachings of Rumi and Alan Watts uh, kind of things and 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 whatnot, and uh, and um, you know, it, it's it's beautiful the thought about, um, and I believe it myself, right? I, it's beautiful the thought about that the oneness, and this is one big uh, theater, right? Uh, uh, and uh, but but sometimes I can't, like um, I can't help myself to 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 think about, and here I'm gonna take inspiration from your language. What the what the fuck is the meaning of of this, right? Like if you are having this fantastic uh, oneness. Why do we separate, and why do we participate in this um, theater and go through, um, you know, loneliness? You know, great things, but also loneliness and fear. To to then again, hopefully, be one with the oneness again, right? And maybe you know, in a lot of the common theories, you you do that again and again and again to learn or rediscover or like if you're that awesome why do we have to separate and go through this what, what do you think about that so there's a distinction that I, I i make a lot in my teaching and and the first thing i'll say actually to the first thing you said is there's one truth in a million teachings now i'm not saying i know what that one truth is but if it's true there's one truth and it does seem to me quite apparent in every teaching that in, in its own way, it's finding that. So I don't worry so much about differences in teaching. I happen to like the principles as a teaching because it's as undogmatic as any teaching I've ever come across. And I like that, that suits me. But I don't think that means it's more true. It's not truth, it's a pointer towards truth. So the distinction that I make is what is true before the therefore? What is true before we make meaning out of it? Meaning is a uniquely intellectual game. Meaning is personal thought. I make it mean this, you make it mean that. That's the realm of the many. That's the realm of the separate, the thought, rea the thought created realities. Whatever is true before the therefore is just true. So I will have conversations about what I think something means and why I think something is in the pub over a, a big glass of beer or a, or a, a nice glass of whiskey, because I think it's fun. I don't think it has anything to do with spirituality or truth. And so I don't really value my own after the therefore any more than I do anybody else's. My entire life is about looking to see what I can see about what's true before the therefore. So next time I'm out your way, you know, and I, I will be, I'll, I'll be back out. Let's grab a beer and let's have a conversation about why the fuck does this happen? Yeah, I like that. But, so in, ter but in terms of spirituality, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. I, I guess that's the big mystery. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Hakan. Uh, a little light one to, to end off with. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Michael, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, tonight and uh, to everyone on this um, webinar, thank you as well. Um, I am guessing I'm not the only one who could listen to, to Michael um, for much longer. So what I will do, uh, because we have to say goodbye, uh, I will um, send you instead to his website, which is uh, michaelneal.org. Um, which has lots of really cool stuff, some, some free stuff, lots of different programs, um, which I think I've done about 99% of them. <laughs> I can vouch for them. They are all <laughs> wonderful. Um, and Michael also has not only one, but two different podcasts. Uh, one is uh, Caffeine for the Soul, which is little bite sizes uh, of, of wisdom and rambles and other wonderful things. And um, a newer one uh, might help can't hurt, which is conversations with, what is it you call it, Michael? Conversations with leaders, doers, and friends. And you've got some really awesome leader doer friends. So um, I do. I learned a lot of inspiration in those conversations. So I definitely recommend that as well. Um, the book, lest you forget, Lil Oblius in Fraud, such a gem. And as I was just reminded before we went on, um, our very own Natasha is joining you and Dickon, who was on our webinar a few weeks ago uh, in Norway um, later this year. So there's a, a wonderful four day retreat um, from the 30th of September um, called uh, Silent Mind, Beautiful Feeling. Um, also at a great price even. So I'm definitely gonna head to the website and, and check that out before it sells out. So if anyone would love to hear more from Natasha, Michael and Dickon, um, check out that uh, retreat, see if it's for you. Hopefully we've all been vaccinated by then and we can actually travel into the world. Um, so we might see you there, Michael. I, I am so, we, my, my wife have our fingers and toes crossed. We're so excited. Yeah. <laughs> Natasha too, definitely. And I'm sure Dickon and his wife as well. Um, but Michael, for now, thank you so much. Um, everyone, if you want to unmute yourself and say thank you and goodbye to Michael, you're very welcome. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye